well, I've had a great, great day. I love the musicians here. I love the singing. I love being with you. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much for having me and uh, being such a blessing to me. I was able to bring my wife tonight, Miriam, right here. Miriam, would you please stand? <laughs> That's great. I like that. I didn't know you were going to clap for her. Thank you very much. Um, we have... Uh, uh, together we've been married, it's coming up on 41 years. We met at the Grand Rapids School of Bible and Music. I talked to you this morning about how I kind of, when I came to Grand Rapids, Michigan, my dad thought I was going to the University of Michigan. And um, so um, when I came to Grand Rapids, not only did I learn the Bible, but I met a lifelong partner. I'm so grateful for her. Um, that beautiful little lady uh, produced uh, five children, started out with twins. Boy and a girl, and now that uh, boy and a girl, they're 35 years old, and our son is a pastor out in Pennsylvania, and our daughter lives up in Grand Rapids, and um, our, uh, let's see, second born, I, I, third born actually, you have twins kind of together, and then our third born is uh, son, he's a pastor out in North Carolina, and then our fourth born is named Amy, uh, she works with the Johnson's daughter down in Winona Lake, Warsaw, Indiana. Amy's husband, Brent, is uh, the dean of the chapel at Grace College and Seminary. And then our youngest, Emily, graduated from Moody. Then she got a Master of Library Science degree. And uh, Emily is living in Grand Rapids. She works at the East Grand Rapids uh, Public Library. So um, we are really blessed and so thankful. Um, I'd like to just remind all of you again that uh, the convention, IFCA convention, is coming right here to Kalamazoo. And I'm so thankful for the support uh, that uh, your church has been giving for this convention. It's really amazing. Uh, choir members, we'd love to see all of you there on Monday night. That would be the last Monday of June, June 26th. And then Thursday night, June 29th um, at 7 p.m. at the Radisson Plaza Hotel. And uh, uh, Mark and I have uh, been talking about all that is going to be involved in that, so really excited about that. And um, speaking on Monday night will be uh, Dr. Christopher Cohn. DrCohn.com is where you can read all about all his stuff. He's pretty prolific, pretty amazing man, and very young. Um, and then um, also Dr. Erwin Lutzer on Tuesday night and Wednesday night. And um, he will be speaking to our convention. Thursday night, I'll be speaking. Uh, Miriam, I told him about the ladies' conference. So, Miriam, if my wife will be standing up here after the service, if you have any questions about the ladies' conference and uh, what you'd like to know about uh, what they do, please see Miriam. You'll be up here. So, um, I've had just already, like I said, a great day today. Um, although I will be honest, went home. And I got back there, and there was a movie on. <laughs> got, uh, this morning, Miriam, I preached against, you know, amusement and amusing ourselves to death. So my wife, she knows me. She, I was telling her, now I'm going to be home about 1.15. And she just was kind of cruising around on the TV. And right there where we eat in the kitchen area, there was a movie I had to see. It was Ike. Countdown to D-Day, starring Tom Selleck as Dwight D. Eisenhower. And I came in, and I walked in, and I went, hey, that looks like World War II stuff. She said, yeah. I said, what, what is this? She said, it's, it's Ike, Countdown to D-Day. I said, oh, forget everything I said this morning. I am watching this movie. <laughs> so I watched the movie this afternoon. And wouldn't you know it, the Lord said, now, Les, you just preached about movies and amusing ourselves to death. So I'm getting ready to come, and my wife said, Les, there's bad news. There's water coming into our basement. Don't watch movies. 
when, when you're preaching on amusing yourself to death. And, you know, so I went, oh, no. And I had to move stuff out. Our basement is, like, finished. It's nice. It's a good thing. It's a, it's, it's a nice place. And so I'm moving stuff and saying, oh, I've got to preach tonight. I don't know if I'm going to be ready. I'm preaching on worry. I'm going to worry myself as I'm moving furniture and throwing towels down and saying, let's get out of here. So... There's a lot about life, isn't there, that's just kind of weird. You're going this way and then this way, these things happen, and that's really, we know that. And as you get, as all of us get older, we know life is not easily, you you try to plan and then things don't go the way we thought. And so what happens is we realize life is weird and we start to worry about the future. We start to think about all the things that could go wrong. And uh, we end up worrying. And so uh, uh, I have five children. Three of them are married. We have uh, five grandsons. And the worries just continue to mount up, all the things that could go wrong. And um, I had a, a guy call me this week. He said, I really need to talk to you. And uh, I was worried about all the stuff that he could have told me. And uh, because he said, I, it's urgent. And so when we talked, he said, they've downsized me and I'm going to lose my job. And I said, oh, that's, oh my goodness. He said, I wasn't sure if it was going to happen, but I went just when we were on spring break, we happened to be in Orlando with our family. And so I went online and was typing up stuff and, and just on a whim, I just kind of typed in a few things and I just put my name in, so, yeah, I I lost my job in Grand Rapids, but I have one in Orlando. I said, and? (laughs) What's the problem here? And, you know, he, we were laughing, and I was telling him all the things I thought he was going to tell me. You can imagine, you know, just the litany of, of all the things that can go wrong in life is what I was thinking. You know, is there an issue this way with his family, with his health, with his marriage? Is he going to tell me about immorality? Is, what's going to happen? I was concerned, and that's how life is, isn't it? It just, you can't have it neatly packaged up. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Two questions about worry. Two questions about worry. The first question is this, is worry always a sin? Well, it kind of depends. And we really basically, we have a few words for worry, but, you know, in our language, but there, there were a few more available in the New, in the New Testament. And so we're going to look at a couple of the worry words in the New Testament. Open your Bibles up to Philippians chapter 2. And if you were here this morning, I talked about Um, Epaphroditus and um, he risked his life he didn't regard his own life this is when I was talking about sacrifice serious ministry is willing to sacrifice and I used Epaphroditus he was on my mind because of tonight but uh, I used him as an illustration this morning Uh, let's take a look a little bit at Epaphroditus to answer this question is worry always a sin of Philippians chapter 2 Philippians 2, verse 25. I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Since he was longing for you all, he was distressed. There's a worry word. He was distressed. You had heard he was sick. So Epaphroditus was not there in Philippi. He's from Philippi, but he's not there. He's with Paul. And he, they, and he said, they found out back home that you're sick. And so he's distressed because you heard he was sick. Indeed, verse 27, he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also. For I should have sorrow upon sorrow if Epaphroditus died. Paul is saying it would have been terrible for me. Verse 28, therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. 
Sorrowful is uh, one of these words I wanted to talk about, worry words. Sorrowful is more accurately translated anxiety. Anxiety. So that's a, that's a, a, a very fine little point I want or draw, line I want to draw here. Anxiety and concern are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, because sometimes worry is the result of love. Love, Epaphroditus, he was loved by the people at Philippi and he was distressed or he was worried about them, verse 26, because they were concerned he was, he was in grave uh, danger. And so Epaphroditus said, or Paul said about Epaphroditus, he was distressed. I don't think that's wrong. I don't think that's wrong. I'm just telling you, I don't think it's wrong. In fact, Paul, he just says in verse 28, I, I'm sending them back to you there in Philippi so that I will be less sorrowful. I don't, I don't want to worry anymore about him either. And so I'm happy he can go home. And, and so because of love, sometimes we have, we have concern. It's not the same as sinful anxiety. Let's look at another one. Let's look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 this is, this is about our Lord himself. The Lord Jesus, as he was, uh, uh, he was 12 years old here, we find that out in Luke chapter 2 and verse 42. Verse 41, his parents went to Jer Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. So Jesus grew up in Nazareth, and they went every year to the feast at Passover as a family did their pilgrimage, and it was between three and four day journey on foot. They were up in Nazareth and they go south down to Jerusalem. And so here he is in verse 42, 12 years old. They went to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. Joseph and his mother did not know it. You would travel in a caravan and Jesus was without sin. Jesus did not sin. So they had absolutely no reason to believe there's a problem because Mary thought Jesus was with Joseph and Joseph thought Jesus was probably up with Mary or somewhere else and they took off and um, they didn't know it. They supposed he had been in the company, in the group. They went a day's journey. So they went a day away, a day's journey from Jerusalem, and they sought him among their relatives and acquaintances when they didn't find him. They returned a day to Jerusalem seeking him. So it was that after three days, they found him in the temple. So I don't think this meant three days they searched for him. It could be, but probably they were searching for him. They were one day away, and then one day back, that's two days, and then looking for him for a day in Jerusalem so for three days and it says that uh, after three days verse 46 they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the teachers both listening to them and asking them questions and when all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers so when they saw him the uh, Mary and Joseph they were amazed his mother said to him son why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. He said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know I must be about my father's business? They didn't understand him. It says that in verse 50. But what we're looking at is this emotion. It says your father in verse 48, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Parents, we understand this, don't we? That's love. That's love. We experience great anxiety, great anxiety. We're worried sick. I can remember my mom saying that. One night I was with some friends, and you know, I just stayed out later than normal, and my mom was worried sick about me. She told me that. She was waiting in my bedroom when I came home. <laughs> and I thought I could kind of sneak in, and she'd be asleep, and I came in, and I wasn't doing anything wrong. I just got in late, my mom was worried sick about me. She was not happy. That's how I was as a dad when my kids are growing up. 
worried sick about my kids. So um, it's love we have for our kids. So moms and dads, as you express your love, make sure the kids know that you're concerned about them because of your love. And kids, when you say, Mom, Dad, stop, come on, just really be thinking they love you, and that's why they're concerned. Sometimes worry is the result of love. Sometimes worry is the result of leadership. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is answering again the question, um, is uh, worry always a sin? I read that somewhere. Someone had a book about worry. He said it's always a sin. And I got to thinking about it. And I think the way he meant it, yes, but the way I was reading it, the idea of love and concern, that's, that's not sin. And leadership, I understand leadership and the concerns of leadership. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 24. Paul is talking about his life. And he says this in verse 24. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of this, in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils or danger, if you're wondering what peril is, in danger, dangers in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily? My deep concern for all the churches. My deep concern for all the churches. That is a Greek word. I'm going to tell it to you because we're going to be looking at another passage. That's the word merimna. Merimna. If you're taking notes and you care, it's M-E-R-I-M-N-A. Merimna. Merimna is a feeling of apprehension because of possible danger or misfortune. Paul is saying he had merimna deep concern for all the churches. He said, that's like above all the rest. All those things I just described, all the dangers, my concerns for the church, my worry, my, my, my love, because of, of his leadership. I know we have elders here tonight and people in leadership positions in the church. The rest of you can listen in. I want to talk directly to the elders. You've got to be concerned. You've got to be concerned. I know. Because Pastor Barnett is, is moving into new ministry. And you love him and you affirm the will of God for his life. But you say, what's going to happen? You know, who's the next one? Who's, who are we going to get? How is this going to be handled? What, what are, you're, you're in a time of transition. It's always a concern. And so Paul calls it merimna here. Deep concern for all the churches you elders have deep concern for this church. Now, the reason I wanted to talk to you elders is because this same word is used in a context of elders. 1 Peter chapter 5, where it talks about the elders. Paul is an elder. I have appealed to you as a fellow elder, and he gives him a charge to the elders, 1 Peter 5. And then in that context, chapter 5, 1 Peter 5, verse 7, he says, casting all your merimna upon him. The context, you know, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. That's 1 Peter 5, elders, primary context. All the rest of you all can understand that too. But primarily, 1 Peter 5, 7, elders, cast your merimna on the Lord. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 28, Paul had it for the churches, and Peter said, cast it, elders, on the Lord, for he cares for you. So leadership brings its own unique pressures and concerns and, and we might even say worries. I don't see that as sin. So first question, is worry always a sin? No, no. Now the second question is this. When do we cross the line from legitimate concern to sinful anxiety? Or another way to put it is, what are the reasons why we shouldn't 
cross the line and take on sinful anxiety. Now we're, we're talking about the things that you probably thought we would begin with. Because sinful anxiety, we understand. And that's usually what we mean by worry, sinful anxiety. So, um, sinful anxiety. By the way, you know this word, worry, the English word comes from? It comes from the German word, Virgen, Virgen. And um, that means uh, to eat, to gnaw, to just, to, to gnaw away at you. That's what worry does. It eating, eats us alive. Um, so, the answer to this question, um, what is, uh, what are the reasons why we shouldn't worry? The first reason, and now we're going to shift our attention to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. This word merimna is going to be used a number of times here in Matthew 6. And depending on the context, merimna can either be sinful anxiety or just that kind that we already saw, concern of, as we saw Paul, the leader, um, in 2 Corinthians 11. Now we're going to start talking about worry where it's not. You, you've crossed the line. It's not just concern. Now it's, it's sinful anxiety. It's a sin. So let's start taking a look. Jesus, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? So um, here Jesus gives the first reason not to worry. Because the God of creation is dependable. You can depend on him. He's dependable. In fact, uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, later on, in verses 29 and 31, he says that your father knows when a sparrow falls to the ground, when a bird falls to the ground. Our heavenly father knows that. That's love. That's love. How grateful I am for God's love for us. And uh, our Heavenly Father, that's something that I know uh, many, many other religions in this world, they, their religion is fear. They're, they're, they're um, unable to approach God. Maybe he's aloof and he's so far removed from us. There's no concern at all for us. No, no. In Matthew 10, like I said, our Heavenly Father knows when the sparrow falls to the ground. And then Jesus said, He also knows how many hairs you have on your head. He, he knows you. And He calls Himself Father. And so the God of creation is dependable. See, basically what He's saying here is that... Um, don't worry about your life, eating, drinking, your body, what you put on. Life's more than food, body more than clothing. He says, look at the birds of the air. That's an interesting word there, that verb, look. Because the word, the look, the, if, if you know, some of you I know know some Greek. So there's a preposition at front, in the front of this verb. And whenever you put a preposition in front of the verb and kind of combine it into one, Greeks can do that in Greek, it intensifies. So it's just not, take a look at the birds of the air. It's more like intensely study the birds. Intensely study them. Study the birds. You know what the study of birds is called? Ornithology. So... You should be a spiritual ornithologist. You should study the birds. Why? Well, it says here, look at the birds, study them, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into bar barns. Birds don't grow their food. 
They don't grow the seeds that they eat. Uh, don't, they don't sow, neither reap, is what Jesus says. They don't gather in the barns. They, they don't gather and stockpile their food and store it. We have, uh, you know, we have freezers and we have lots of, uh, uh, of storage for our food. And Jesus says, look at the birds, study them. They're not growing their food. They're not stockpiling their food. Um, instead, it says, um, they gather their food each day. They take one day at a time and they just gather their food. And it's interesting, this little story from church history. It's reported once that Martin Luther, he sat and he just was watching a bird on a tree limb. And he was overwhelmed with the pressures that were on him in his life and the pressures that were uh, so... Um, they were just coming in on him. And he just started, he, he thought of this verse, and he just was studying the birds. And he, he said, the birds seem to be singing to me. And this is what he wrote. Mortal, me, mortal meanings a uh, person who's alive, a man. Mortal, cease from cares and sorrow, God provideth for tomorrow. Mortal, cease from cares and sorrow, God provideth for tomorrow. And Luther said he was just watching. He was watching the birds. And I'm telling you, I grew up as a kid. I, you know, had a BB gun in Minnesota. <laughs> Popping off birds. Don't tell the moms this. Guys like doing that, those little boys with BB guns. Shh, shh, don't say. But I, I would shoot like little birds, think I was, you know, a hunter and, you know, uh, now, I love to look at them. I'm so happy. My wife, she likes birds, and uh, I like listening to their, their, their sound, um, the birds singing. I love birds um, as they fly, and uh, as Luther said, mortal, cease from cares and sorrow God provideth for tomorrow. That's what he said. It seemed like the birds were telling him. And so we see here, God will take care of you. The God of creation is dependable. It says that. Your heavenly Father feeds the birds. Are you not more value than they? So, the God of creation, dependable. First reason not to worry. Second reason not to worry. Verse 27. Which of you, by worrying... There's that word again, Merimnah, can add one cubit to his stature. Meaning, by worrying, you can't make yourself taller, or else, we're not really sure. The Greek scholars are just not sure. Is it also, it's, it could be used about a, a, a length of time. By worrying, you can't make your life longer. So, what Jesus is really saying in verse 27 is worry accomplishes nothing. Worry accomplishes nothing. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to a stature or uh, can add um, any further length to your life? You can't. By worrying, it's, it, you can't. It, it's, it's like rocking in a rocking chair. You're just doing this. You're really not doing much more, and uh, you can't do anything. Worrying is like rocking in a rocking chair. You expend a lot of energy, but you don't get anywhere. You say, oh, this is a serious problem. That's really terrible. I spent eight hours worrying about it. Oh, my, oh, my. And so worry accomplishes nothing. Um, my, my sister married a guy who was uh, from Athens, Greece. They actually lived in Athens for 30 years. He was, he's an, a, a maritime lawyer. He was a lawyer in a shipping company. And so uh, my Greek brother-in-law, he introduced all of us to, they call them the worry beads. And they were just like these, these beads, and they were different sizes. And my dad had them, and you'd kind of flip them around, and I don't know what they're like. They're just like beads, and you just flip them around, and that's what they call them, worry beads. And <laughs> I first saw them in about seventh or eighth grade. I said, what are those? My dad laughed. said, oh, George, my brother-in-law. George says they're, they're, you use them when you're worried. 
Whoa, that's really helpful, isn't it? <laughs> Just flipping this, you know, flipping the beads. Um, I uh, preached um, a sermon on worry once in a church in California. And after the sermon, a woman came up to me and said this. My husband tells me I worry too much and that 99% of what I worry about never happens. And I tell him, see, it works. <laughs> I said, you know, I was so, I, I told her, I'm so happy to finally find someone whose worrying was so effective. <laughs> but it does, it accomplishes nothing. So what is the difference then between worry and concern? Well, concern will motivate you to take the initiative and to do something in love. I'm concerned. Concerned for you. I'm very concerned. I'll come. I'll come to your house. You come to mine. I'll spend some time with you. Yeah, we'll talk. I'll do this. I'll help you. That's what love is, and that's concern. That is taking the initiative, motivates you to take initiative. Worry is fear, and it paralyzes you. It decreases your initiative. It sends you into the rocking chair and you just rock and then you grab the worry beads and you do this. Nothing happens. It's fear and it overwhelms you and it paralyzes you. It decreases your initiative. Whereas concern motivates you to take initiative in love. So the first reason not to worry, the God of creation is dependable. Second reason not to worry. Worry accomplishes nothing. Third reason not to worry. Verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? There's this merim now again, used over and over again in the passage. Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. You see, this, by the way, I said to be a spiritual bird watcher, spiritual ornithologist, now you need to become a spiritual botanist because that word consider the lilies of the field is one of those words that um, put a preposition on the front of it and intensifies it. So you're just not considering it. You're intentionally studying it. It's a little shade different verb, but uh, uh, that we talked about the birds when you are to study the birds, look at the birds of the air. Now you're to study or look or consider the lilies of the field. You're to consider all of those, those beautiful flowers. Um, just Friday night, Miriam and I took our daughter for her birthday, and we wanted to show her a place we really like. If you've never been to Holland, it's, it's a fun little town. You walk around Holland, Michigan. You walk around, and especially this weekend, the tulips were so beautiful, and we were taking pictures just like tourists of, of my daughter for her birthday in front of the tulips and all that. It was so beautiful. The flowers are really nice. Um, and uh, we're to consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, the furnace, it gets burned up as fuel, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? The third reason not to worry is worry is sinful lack of faith in God's dependability. In fact, it says there, Jesus says, O you of little faith. Let's explore this idea a little bit here. Um, so we have, he says, consider the, the flowers, the lilies of the field, and they're beautiful. And Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like that. Well, that's saying an awful lot because uh, in the Old Testament, in 2 Chronicles 20, uh, 9, verse 22, it said, King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. It was amazing. In fact, the Queen of Sheba from North Africa in 1 Kings 10, 6 and 7 said, I heard reports about you in my land, but I didn't believe the reports until I came and my own eyes saw it. And behold, the half wasn't told me. Everything I heard that I thought was an exaggeration was not even half of what I've actually seen. You're double 
what I thought. You exceed in wisdom and prosperity even the reports I've received. So what we're saying is Solomon, in all of his glory, all of his splendor, Jesus said, not even Solomon was arrayed like one of these. So think about these lilies and say, if God clothes grass like that, which today is here and then tomorrow is thrown in the oven or it's used for fuel, uh, dried grass was an important source of fuel in Palestine with all of its sparseness of trees. So he's saying, the grass, it's so beautiful and then it's gone and then throw it into the furnace. Will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Little faith. He'll much more clothe you. The idea there, uh, much more clothe you. He will um, clothe you exceedingly greater. Exceedingly greater. It's just kind of a couple of words piled on top of each other. Will he not much more exceedingly greater clothe you? And then he says this, oh, you of little faith. That's what I really wanted to get to. It's because worry is a sinful lack of faith in God's dependability. Think of what Jesus is really saying. Worry is a lack of faith. It's sin. It's an intrusion on God's sovereign, providential hand. Think about this. Let's put our theological hats on. Worry shifts focus from the power of God and his sufficiency to you. You are actually saying to the Lord God of the universe, I'm sorry, God, you can't handle this. I'm going to have to take over. Just think about that. Sorry, God. Yeah, yeah, I, I, we know the Bible says how great you are, but right now, I got to take over. I got to handle this. It's, it's up to me. I'm going to do it now. And that's why Jesus said, it's sin when you say this because you are shifting your focus from the sovereign God to yourself. And that's foolish because you're shifting from his almighty power to your puny little weakness. And so you uh, demonstrate little faith, little faith. But notice verse 32 Let's continue on, verse 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek, people who aren't believers. They're seeking after what they're going to eat, drink, and wear. That's what unbelievers do. Your heavenly Father knows you need these things. Remember again, earlier I was talking about the difference in Christianity and so many of the other of the world religions is our creator God. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ and you trust Christ as your savior and you become a Christian, our creator God of the universe, the sovereign, majestic God of the universe is our father. Our Father. See that? After all these things Gentiles seek, they don't know God the way the believer does. They're not related to God the way the believer in Jesus Christ is. After all these things the Gentiles seek, they're out there worrying and that's the way they live. Your Heavenly Father knows you need these things. But you seek. See, in my Bible, I have circled seek. Verse 32, all these things the Gentiles seek. Verse 33, seek. You, you seek after first the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. You see, the fourth reason why we not to worry. Worry keeps us from pursuing what's most important. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other things that we worry about. For me, here I'm talking. Remember this morning I was talking big about entertainment. and uh, don't, don't entertain and amuse yourselves to death. And I admit to you, I get home and there's a World War II movie I haven't seen yet. i got to watch it till 3.30. From 1.15 to 3.30 I watched it. 
And then I said, okay, got to start thinking about tonight. Miriam came to me and said, bad news, there's water in the basement. Oh, I did what I could. And now the truth is, I'm kind of thinking about it. <laughs> What's my basement going to be like when I get home? That's the way it is. You see, worry keeps us, if we're not careful, worry keeps us from pursuing what's most important. Is keeping the water out of my basement most important? Well, tonight it's going to be when I get home. It's going to be important. But Jesus says, seek first, top priority, the idea of uh, first is first in time, first in place, first in order, as opposed to all the clamor and all the, of the pressures from people and possessions and power and pleasure and prestige, all these things that, that clamor in and push in on us, Jesus said, make number one your seeking, your, uh, your persevering, energetic concern. Seek first, first priority, the kingdom of God, his righteousness. Submit to God, the kingdom. Submit to his kingdom. He's the king of the universe, so submit to him. Submit to his rule. Submit to his authority. Submit, says here. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The kingdom of God, it's about the king who demands our obedience, our submission. But it also says his righteousness. Remember we talked this morning a lot about righteousness. Well, here it comes up again. Seek after his holy ways. If you're not a Christian, you cannot earn his righteousness. If you are a Christian and have trusted Christ as your Savior and the righteousness of Christ is now uh, imputed to you or counted for you in your account before God, if you have been declared righteous before God the Father, you have Christ's righteousness in your life, now, seek first God's kingdom and his authority in your life and seek first the righteousness that now you can follow. Seek first the kingdom. Seek first his righteousness. These are the most important things in life. And when we worry, we're kept from pursuing what's most important. Where are we instead of pursuing what we should be? We're in a rocking chair with the worry beads flipping them going, oh, going to happen. I, I don't know. Oh, I'm so worried. I'm so worried. Worry keeps us from pursuing what's most important. That's the fourth reason Jesus gives. The fifth reason not to worry. He gives it in verse 34. Therefore, 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 in light of all that he said, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. It's plenty of worries tomorrow. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The fifth reason not to worry, because worry about the future hampers our efforts for today. Jesus contrasted here two days. He said, tomorrow. And then he's talking to them, sufficient for the day, meaning today. There's two days today and tomorrow. The two days indeed are contrasted by Christ. Tomorrow's not for us. It doesn't belong to us. Tomorrow always belongs to God. So we leave it with him. We say, Lord, you are in control. You are the king. I will let tomorrow be yours. I can only do what I do today. So I'll do my efforts today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for each day is its own trouble. Handle one day at a time. One task at a time. The idea of one task at a time is uh, the idea that we are to um, handle the one thing that we can. I know sometimes I get overwhelmed. I do. My wife knows um, so many things I have to do for so many different people all around the world. And I, I just start getting overwhelmed. And then I just kind of remember this verse, say, you know, I'm going to do just this one thing. So I'll do this one thing. Check it off the list. They say, okay, well, it's only 11.30 in the morning. I'll do this one thing. 
I do that, check that off the list. And pretty soon, by the end of the day, I said, instead of worrying all day, I actually went to work for in today, and I didn't worry about tomorrow. I was able to get something done. So worry never robs tomorrow of its sorrow. It only saps today of its strength. And so uh, one person said it this way, when you worry, you pile up a lot of tomorrows and end up with a lot of empty yesterdays. <laughs> so when you're worrying, you're piling up a lot of tomorrows in your worry, and then you keep doing that, and each day you end up with a lot of empty yesterdays because you didn't do anything. Nothing happened because you were worrying about tomorrow. So the idea is this. Key words, verse 30, faith. Oh, you have little faith. Trust in our God. Another key word, verse 32, our Father, your Father, Heavenly Father, He cares for us. He cares for you. He loves you. Faith, Father. Verse 33, first, priorities. The priorities of God's authority in our life and His holy ways. Seek after those. And then verse 34, I just, because I'm having all these Fs, there's not an F here that works, but verse 34, I have focus. The ta focus on tasks for today, one day at a time, one task at a time. Faith, Father first, focus, we see there in this. Now, as we've just got another minute or two before we end, I would like to have us turn to the verse that Pastor Dave talked about this morning when he talked about my sermon tonight. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Says this, verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse 6 be anxious for nothing. There's merim nao, merim na, the, in the verb form. Stop being anxious. Pray. Thank God. Adjust your mind the way you think, verse 8. Verse 9, do the things you know you should. You've learned them, now do them. The peace of God will pass. All understanding will be yours. It's a conscious choice. And so, worries unnecessary, God takes care of us. Worry is useless, doesn't change a thing. Worry is blind to the lessons of the birds and the flowers. Worry is an intrusion, sinful intrusion on God's providence, his sovereign hand. Worry is failure to trust God. Worry is robbery, stealing tomorrow when it's not even here yet. Don't worry about tomorrow. So where are you looking? Around? If you're looking all around you, you'll be distressed, worried, if you look inside, you'll be depressed. You look above, you'll be at rest. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness to us. Thank you that for those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have you taking such wonderful and loving care of us. Perhaps there's someone here tonight, Lord, who does not know you as their Savior. I pray, Father, that you will please work in their hearts, their minds, and help them, O oh Lord, to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. And for the person who is a Christian and they're worried about tomorrow, help them, Lord, to take comfort in what we heard tonight. And help us, Lord, to rid ourselves of these fears and instead to focus with love on the things we can do around us. Pray in Jesus' name, amen.